Well, thank you. I'm Kim. I'm an alcoholic. Through God's grace, AA and sponsorship, I've been sober since December 16th of 1998. And for that, I'm truly grateful. Um, I want to thank everybody that put this together and Cindy for putting me out there to speak. And um, it's nice to meet everybody virtually online. Um, I have a sponsor and she has a sponsor and I sponsor women. So I'm active in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, this virus definitely has put a little damper on my ability to go out and see those and, and be in the community, but I still find ways to help and contribute and to be of service um, by sponsoring women and, and doing things through, um, even though I'm at home a lot. So um, it's always an honor to speak at Alcoholics Anonymous anytime, anywhere. So thanks for having me. Um, let me tell you a little bit about me. I'm uh, My topic is Federer to Faithful, and it's on page 51 in the big book. And what it says is, in the realm of the material men's mind were fettered by superstition, tradition, and all sorts of fixed ideas. Um, and I'll definitely talk about that in my, uh, in my talk. So we'll get there. But uh, I was raised in Sharonville, Ohio. And um, I, you know, I, don't, I always felt different, you know. In one way or another, I always felt different. I went to Catholic school and was raised in a Catholic school, and I have nothing against that, um, but I was taught what to do, when to do it, and how to do it, um, and when I got old enough to take my first drink, uh, that Catholic school religion and all that went with it went to the wayside as quickly as it came into my life, and uh, I had no room for it because I knew straight away that if you know, there was a God or there was a higher power that he had no room for me from what I had learned. And uh, so my first drink I had was a Hootie Delight. My girlfriend lived across the street. We both had brothers that were about five years older than us. And uh, they were having a party. And in order for us to shut up and not tell on them, they had us beer. And uh, I had a Hootie Delight. And I remember taking a drink of that Hootie Delight and thinking, ugh, that just tastes awful. And the older gentleman next to me said, just drink past that uh. And he was right. As soon as I drank past the uh, it uh, put a little warm feeling in my belly and uh, my fears, my problems, and my troubles seemed to disappear, you know, at a, at a young age, how many fears and troubles and problems I had, but I had my fair share. And I used those to drink over for a very long time. So what I remembered from drinking that first night was I rolled down a hill, shaking my head, you know, Sharon B or Sharon C now talks about how her, you know, she got taller and her hair got longer and she got funnier and I could relate, you know, I really related to that. I became all of those things and, and all of my fears fell to the wayside. And for that night, it was true for me too. I walked home and, and alcohol had become my courage and I wasn't afraid to go home to that house where I had uh, encountered, you know, uh, a not great, so great childhood. And uh, I wanted to do that every moment I could from then on out. Um, if they had parties, you know, it could have been, I, you know, I used it that I would, if you had a, a life like I had, you'd drink too. You know, that was me. I got a fake ID when I was younger. Uh, I got an apartment, got emancipated when I was 16 in the state of Ohio, um, got an apartment, moved into that apartment. And uh, I had a telephone and the girl upstairs had, you know, was able to buy beer. So we formed a very fast friendship and uh, she could come use my phone and I would, she would buy me beer, you know, and she got tired of buying me so much beer, I guess, because she thought it'd be a good idea for us to go down to the local license bureau and uh, get myself a fake ID, get my own ID so she didn't have to buy it for me anymore. And we walked in there together and that's exactly what we proceeded to do. I put down all of her information. We looked really similar. We both had long blonde hair and brown eyes. She was a little bit taller than I was and she was old enough to drink. And I put down all of her information on that, on that little piece of paper and told them, you know, I'm her. And uh, they never questioned it, not even once. And back in the day, they used to send your license to Columbus. And in Columbus, they would do their thing and then they'd send it back to you. Well, we didn't put an apartment number on it. Long story short, she got her driver's license back and I had, an, I had a license to drink, if you will. So we went to bars, as many bars as we could go to. Um, and we drank and when we, and we just drank, you know, there was one time we walked into a bar and um, in Cincinnati is, you know, Annie's and uh, we walked into this bar and we walked in right next to each other and they kind of caught, you know, your Rochelle and your Rochelle. So they kind of stopped that really quick. They didn't take my ID, thank goodness. But uh, so we knew we had to kind of stagger into bars and, uh, and 
you know, I ended up being the, you know, fun at first, I think I always thought. And before long, I was the drunk crying in the corner. If you had a life like I had, you'd drink too. If you had a life like I had, you'd drink too. And truth be told, that's not why I'm an alcoholic. Heck, it could be, this used to be my favorite time to drink. Springtime into summertime, get a 40 ounce and get in my car and drive the 275 loop. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but I turned the music up really loud and put a friend or two in the car and I felt freedom. You know, I felt I had arrived and uh, uh, that's what I like to do. And um, somewhere along the line there, I'd went out drinking with my mom on this fake ID uh, down at uh, How the Moon Saloon, uh, which is in Covington or was in Covington. And we went drinking and it was me and her and my best friend and her friend. And the best friend, girlfriend that I grew up drinking with my whole life, her dad was a Cincinnati police officer. So we used that card a whole lot to get out of a lot of trouble all the time. And we'd been drinking at Howl at the Moon Saloon. And I was just doing what I do when I drink, you know, and I was stuck in face with this guy because he was buying the beer, you know. Uh, but in my mind, you know, I was probably going to marry him. Uh, I didn't know his name, but I was probably going to marry him. And uh, life was absolutely amazing. Like it was perfect. It was, I was happy and content and, you know, just feeling my 10 minutes of yes, you know, when you drink and you hit the mark and just, you just barely hit the mark and you have that 10 minutes that you end up chasing your whole life. I had that 10 minutes of life couldn't be any better than it is right now. And uh, they all wanted to leave. And I couldn't imagine why they would want to end this like, um, you know, wonderful time right now. And um, so we left and we went into the parking garage and I always had these ideas that, you know, I would do X, Y, Z and the results would be ABC. And that is just never typically how it happened. So in my mind, I was like, I'm going to, uh, you know, I want to stay drinking. If I can find for a, a way for us to go back in and continue drinking, everything will continue to be amazing and great. Uh, and if the police showed up and uh, I thought to myself, well, maybe I will just tell them we're all too drunk to drive and then we'll have to go back inside and drink. And that's not what happened. I said, you know, we're all too drunk to drive. And my best friend uh, took a swing at me and they arrested her and took her to jail in Kenton County, Kentucky. And then uh, my mom had the ignition, uh, the keys in her car. And they said, ma'am, whatever you do, since you've been drinking, don't sit down or you'll get a DUI. And she got arrested. She sat down. She forgot. So the other girl, I have no idea where she went, but here we are out drinking. I'm the only one underage with a fake ID causing trouble, wanting to go in and drink. And they're both arrested and carted off to jail. <laughs> you know? And I'm feeling sorry for myself, you know, so they're leaving, they're going to jail. I'm alone. Uh, it's, you know, three thirty, four o'clock in the morning. I went back into the hotel where the bar was called people I knew to come get me. Nobody's going to come get me. Hi, I'm Kim. You know, I'm your hairdresser. I was a hairdresser at the time. You know, and I'm calling you at three o'clock in the morning saying, will you come pick me up? You know, and hi, I, you know, I'm Kim, I'm your hairdresser. Will you come and get me? Click. You know, they just kept hanging up on me. And I wasn't a hairdresser for much longer after that. I, I lost my clientele. But after nobody would come and get me, I'm walking from Kentucky to Ohio across the bridge. And it had rained a lot like it, it is right now uh, in Cincinnati, Ohio. We've gotten a lot of rain. And when that happens, you know, the Ohio Rover gets really muddy and it swells. And that's exactly what had happened. And I'm walking from Kentucky to Ohio uh, at 3.30ish, 4 in the morning, something like that. And I'm all alone. And, you know, I, I want to die. You know, I just, I, I, you know, I've got a God-sized hole and I have no idea that's what that is. I just knew that I was alone and by myself and I felt sad and lonely and it, it was unbearable. Nobody would come and get me. And here I am all by myself, all alone. And all I wanted to do was die. And I don't think I really wanted to die. I didn't want to kill the girl. I wanted to kill the moment. But I'm pretty dramatic. So I went through the whole thing, you know. Uh, they'll be sorry they didn't come and get me. And I'll be laying in my coffin. You know, I've got my eyes closed. I'm imagining all this because I'm very imaginative. <laughs> dramatic, imaginative, whatever. And I'm laying, in, you know, pretending like I'm laying in my coffin. And they come by and they say, oh, wasn't she sweet? We should have went and picked her up. And you know, and my next thought was, no, Kim, you'll jump and you'll like break your leg and break your back and you'll float for weeks or even months clinging on to life and they'll find you just in time to save you, you know, and that's not what I wanted either. You know, I didn't want to be in pain and, and I didn't want to survive it, you know, um, so I ended up hitchhiking home, went back to work the next day 
and I worked in Kenwood, Ohio uh, at a hair salon. Um, and it was a day just like any other day. I, you know, I came in hungover. I worked with 78 hairdressers and uh, the break room was always full of people uh, smoking or eating or telling jokes or and this particular day I'm sitting there and I'm all by myself and that alone is definitely uh, unusual and then a few minutes later this girl comes in that's always happy and I always wanted to know her but I could never you know stick out my hand and say hi I'm Kim I'm an alcoholic or or whatever and she looked at me and she said, and I, she looked at me, I don't think she said anything. And I said, I think I'm an alcoholic. Can you help me? <laughs> and as soon as I said it, she ran out the door and I thought, oh my gosh, like, what have I done? She was excited. She was like, I'll be right back. And she ran out the door and she can't, you know, we had French doors and the doors kind of went poof. And I thought, <laughs> what have I done? What did I just do? You know, uh, alcohol was always my solution. I don't know where that came from. And she came back in with this blue book you know, um, and this is the book that she had, you know, she came back in with this book and this was in 1992 and, uh, she sat it down and she said, Oh, this is so great. Like, I think it had my name in the front of it. I don't know. I've lost the front cover of my front book. Uh, and she, you know, I just the, like, they were all waiting for me, you know, like she was prepared and, uh, she said, we're going to a meeting at a clubhouse called four or five Oak street. The meeting, it was a Sunday. She said, I'll pick you up at seven o'clock for seven thirty meeting. And she was as gone as quick as she came. And I just remember thinking, uh oh, like, what have I done? And uh, she came and picked me up. We went to 405 Oak Street, with, uh, Oak Street, which is a clubhouse in Cincinnati. And um, we walked in and uh, it was crowded. And I sat behind uh, like a column, if you will, um, hiding and scared. And she leaned over me and she said, they're going to ask if there's anybody new, you might want to say you're Kim, you're an alcoholic. And I thought to myself, I didn't even speak it. I just thought to myself, there is no way I'm telling anybody I'm an alcoholic. And it's like, she could read my mind. She said, you know, don't worry. They're all alcoholic too. It never dawned on me why you were there. I just knew that I was there and I was scared to death. Um, after that, Emily R spoke and, um, she starts, she's, if you know Emily, she's amazing. And she got up on this, you know, the podium and she said, hi, I'm Emily. I'm an alcoholic. And she laughed. Ha, 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 ha. And you all laughed. And I thought, well, that's not funny. <laughs> you know, and a few minutes later, she'd say something and, you know, everybody would laugh. And I would just think that's just not, that's not funny. Uh, and so after that meeting, what happened next was astounding. Um, you know, a line of women formed and at Oak Street, there's a uh, two rows, two rows of chairs with like, with like an aisle in between, and it can go, goes out into the hallway anyway. Uh, people started uh, forming that line, and they weren't going to thank the speaker, and they weren't thanking the the chairperson. They were coming to get to say hi to me because I said I was new, um, and that was in 1992. And you know, those women that day said a president in my life that they saved my life. And you would think to yourself, how can somebody just giving a name and a phone number to somebody save somebody's life? But those women were saving my life. And uh, they came up and they said, hi, my name's Mickey. And wrote down the number, hi, my name's Laura. And at the time, I didn't think it was a miracle. As a matter of fact, I was a little overwhelmed and a little uncomfortable, <laughs> if you want me to be honest. And I had this list of women's names that were, you know, call me anytime, day or night, 24 hours a day. And uh, went out on the, after that, went out onto the little porch there. And uh, that crazy girl that took me to that meeting uh, was my sponsor. She, you know, I don't think I even asked her to be my sponsor. I think she just appointed herself and rightly so. And she, you know, was out there on the front porch with me. And she said, you know, I want you to write this in your book. So she gave me a pen, handed me this book. Uh, you know, she said, uh, and number one, write this. And she said, pray in the morning and pray at night and ask God to keep you, ask him to keep you clean and sober and thank him at night on your knees. And, uh, you know, read this big book every night, the first 164 pages, always call your sponsor. And she put her name and her phone number in the book. So I, I had it right here. <laughs> 
work the steps and go to meetings, say yes to AA. I mean, she's just got all the same stuff in here today that is still true. You know, I've added get a home group and get a job in my home group and, and you know, sponsor women and all that kind of stuff. But she wrote all this in my big book. And I think she looked at me and she said, do you have a problem with God? And in the very beginning, and I, and she went, oh, oh, it doesn't matter. You're going to pray. You know, you're going to ask him to keep you clean and sober. So I left that meeting and I left that night with a little bit of hope, you know, um, walked away from that meeting. And I thought, I'm going to, I'm going to do this thing. I'm an all or nothing alcoholic. I'm going to do this thing. She wanted me to read the first 164 pages. And she told me, you know, she said, you know, underline it in a highlighter, you know, pencil or whatever. And I went home, read the first 164 pages and I called her back and I was like, I'm done. I, you know, I did it. And uh, she kind of was like, you did what, you know? And uh, I said, I read the, I'm done. I read the first 164 pages and she kind of chuckled and said, you know, do it again in a different color. And I thought, well, that's stupid. <laughs> and I went back and, you know, I took a couple of days and I got another highlighter color and, or a pencil or a pen or what have you, and started reading it again and, and underlining what stuck out to me or what I could relate to. And, um, you know, I called her back and said, I'm done. And she laughed and chuckled at me again. And she said, you know, Kim, do it again. And it's amazing because I've got pen and pencil and purple and orange and yellow and green and blue and all different kind of mm -hmm. colors in here from different times that I've read the book over and over and over. And what she was teaching me is it's a textbook. It's a textbook for life. You know, it has all the answers in there. If I choose to read it, if I choose to open myself up through it, uh, to it, you know, um, it's a, it's a design for living that works. Um, so, you know, reading that every day, uh, and that's what she was teaching me to do. And it always, you know, it never fails. And we all know this and we all, I think most of us feel this way. I know it's true for me that every time I read it, there's always something else in there and I have read it and I have read it and I have read it and there's still new things that pop in there. And it just amazes me every time. So here I am doing Alcoholics Anonymous 150%. I'm reading the book. I'm doing the steps. I'm doing all the stuff the sponsor's asking me to do. And this guy, him, walks in. And, you know, I, I don't know much other of what's going on because, you know, my nose is in the book. But when he comes in, it's all about him. And he stalked me, I'm sure. And I must have thought he really liked me because isn't that what stalking means? You know, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, but at the time, I really believed he must really like me a whole lot because he's following me around everywhere I go. And uh, we had a long conversation, you know, we, how we were going to take our relationship slow. And before I knew it, we were pregnant and we were married. Wait a minute. We were pregnant. We didn't get married till after we had my daughter, but we were pregnant. And uh, it was about three months into our relationship. And uh, I don't know. I thought he had two years of sobriety and he had like two weeks. You know, I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, and I had two years of sobriety-ish. And uh um, uh, we got pregnant and I had my daughter, uh, Madison, uh, in 1994. Um, not long after that, um, I freely gave back to you those steps of Alcoholics Anonymous that you had given me. I'd given up my seat. And what that looked like when it was happening was <clears throat> they don't really like me. You know, I don't really need to go to that meeting anyway. I need to stay home and work on my relationship. You know, 90210 is on Wednesday nights and I really need to watch that instead. Um, my husband wants to have dinner with me and I should really invest in my relationship. Um, the girls are talking about me at the meeting anyway. I don't really think they like me. They're really probably, you know, how you were different from me. All of a sudden, everything started to change. And before I knew it, I had isolated myself. I wasn't picking up the phone. I wasn't reading my big book. I wasn't praying on my knees. I wasn't going to meetings. I wasn't working with women. I wasn't doing any of those things that you had taught me to do in the very beginning. And of course I drank. Of course I drank. Uh, when it was presented to me, it was just as easy as uh, somebody said, here, do you want a beer? And I had a beer in my hand and I was drinking it before I knew it. Now, later on that night, the girl that handed me a beer, her and I had the same sponsor and uh, we called and we drunk dialed my sponsor, uh, you know, uh, that night. I'm not proud of that. Uh, but we seemed to laugh and think it was just funny. And, uh, you know, oh, we're drinking, ha, 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 you know, and we hung up. And what happened was after she left, I called my sponsor and I. We're trying when, to be cooperative and comply, but we're not sure what to comply to. Right when now. she left. Uh, change the name in. Sorry. Name. So when she left, um, 
or when I hung up with her on the phone, I uh, called her back when my, the other girl left and I said, listen, I'm drinking and I'm scared and I don't know what to do. And she said to me, she said, uh, you're drunk, call me when you're sober. And she hung up on me and she should have, you know, um, somewhere in there, uh, I ended up having, you know, my daughter, or I had my daughter at that time. And uh, that night, I had found my way upstairs and I don't remember how I got my daughter and her bed or how I got to bed. Cause I remember waking up at three o'clock in the morning, unable to move, you know, my hair was stuck to my face. I had slobber, you know, how beautiful we are when we're passed out on the couch at three in the morning, you know, and here I have this brand new baby that I want to stay sober for. And I can't, you know, I'm not, and uh, I can't get up and take care of her like I want to. So I got scared the next day and I thought, that's it. I can't drink, I can't drink anymore, you know, but having a decision to say, I can't drink anymore is a real big fool to myself because I don't have that choice. I don't have the power of choice. And um, so I continued to do some other things that I thought would make me, you know, I, I never drank one night and came back into Alcoholics Anonymous. I was out for about a year or so. Uh, somewhere he said he was coming back in AA and I thought not without me because we get well when we get here and I knew that he would leave. Uh, he would get well and he would see how sick I am and he would go. So I got sober. Um, I did this a couple of times. I had two years of sobriety, had a baby drink, had two years of sobriety, had a baby drink. Uh, that second baby, I, my husband was having an affair and I used that as an excuse to drink instead of praying for God to keep me clean and sober. I prayed for God to make her leave and make him stay. You know, uh, it, you know, my priorities changed. If I could just, you know, stay home, I could make, you know, maybe I could make them not have an affair, you know, uh, whatever sick story I was telling myself, instead of going to meetings, reaching out to you and being of service, you know, um, so I drank again. Um, so two years, baby drank, two years, baby drank. And I am, you know, uh, chucking along in Alcoholics Anonymous and, um, I've got a different sponsor at this time. I went at this time when I got sober, I went to a meeting at Oak street and I walked into Oak street. I had just been off of a, you know, have a baby drink episode and I was out there. Baby was in 1997. This was in 1998. So I'd been out for about a year. Um, and I came back in and it's really hard to come into Alcoholics Anonymous when you've been outside of Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, to, it's a big shout out to my way didn't work, you know? Um, so I walked into Alcoholics Anonymous. I walked into 405 Oak Street and you guys were you loving and caring and wonderful. And Chuck H was there and uh, he looked at me and he was like, I am so glad you're here. And I just remember thinking, ooh, like stay away from, like he must have felt the vibe of, oh, die or something because I was not happy to be in Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, he took two steps back and he looked at me and he said, you know what? Stay sick. You're teachable when you're sick. And that just made me mad. You know, don't tell me to stay sick. I'll get sober. By gosh, you know, I was just curious. Um, and then there was a spiky girl or girl there. Her name was Lori and she had like platinum spike hair and I just loved her to death. And her sponsor was Beth. And uh, we went to a conference that weekend and um, I just thought if she'll work for her, she's going to work for me. Uh, I walked into the, she did taping at the time, and uh, I walked into the tape room at this conference where she was, and I just, you know, was kind of twirling my hair and really nervous and said, you know, uh, do you think maybe you would be my sponsor? And she said to me, she said, if you want what I have, you'll do what I do, and this is what I do. And she said, you know, if I have something strawberry with, you know, strawberries and white sugar and white flour, I'm going to have a strawberry cake, and if you do something that is chocolate with brown sugar and chocolate chips, you're going to have something different than what I have. So if you want what I have, you'll do what I do. And that today is what I try to do the best of my ability. I have a home group. It's Fox Hall on Monday night, seven o'clock. Um, I typically have a job in my home group uh, with the coronavirus and things happening and different things happening in my life. I haven't obviously been able to go out to that meeting as my home group, my home group, but I do try to attend it online. We have a meeting online. Um, I have got a, a new position. Uh, I'm a nurse now, um, and I'm uh, 12 hour shifts at night. And that's new. That's a position they threw me in because I had a car accident um, back in October, and it rendered me unable to do my regular nursing job that I was doing prior to. So, um, anyway, um, to take a step back, I uh, was um, got the sponsor, and I'm going to Fox Hall, which is my home group. And about had about two years of sobriety and I walked into my meeting in Fox Hall on a Monday night and I went up to my sponsor, Beth, and I said, 
I think I'm pregnant. Two years sobriety, baby drink. Two years sobriety, baby drink. Two years sobriety and I'm pregnant. And I'm just crying. And she's like, good, because you're the 10 minute speaker. And I thought to myself, I don't know how that is. I don't know how that's going to solve what I'm telling you here to get up there and cry in front of all of you. Uh, but I did. I got up at my home group that I had been a member of now 21 years uh, and cried and just told you exactly where I was. And it allowed my home group, because when you go to a home group over time, you get to know the people in the home group, you get a job in the home group. So you show up when you'd rather, you know, do something else or when you feel like you have something else to do, it keeps me in the center of Alcoholics Anonymous, having that home group and having that job in that home group. And then when you don't show up, people wanna know where you are. You develop this family and this fellowship about you by doing those simple steps. And I had no idea those are the things that I was doing. So I stand up in front of my home group that particular day and I cry through my whole lead and say, you know, I've been sober two years, had a baby drink, been sober two years, had a baby drink, and I'm two years sober and I'm, and I'm pregnant and I'm crying. You guys gave me a job of cake, babe. I had to bring the cake every Monday night, whether I wanted to or not. And, uh, you know, I couldn't let you alcoholics down and not bring that daggone cake. So it got me to meetings when sometimes I didn't want to go. Um, so I'm doing Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm doing all these things. My sponsor has this thing called an advance because we advance, we don't retreat. And uh, it's to go, you know, uh, into the middle of the woods with all these women and talk about God's service and unity. And uh, who thought that I would want to do that when I first got sober? Because I certainly did not. I didn't hang out with the women. I hung out with the men. And here I am. I've got this new baby and we're headed off to the middle of the woods with all these women. And I'm having issues. I'm passing out. A sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm used to passing out when I'm drinking, but here I am sober and I'm passing out and I don't know why and I don't know what's going on. And you guys taught me how to, you know, push for answers, how to ask, you know, doctors, hey, what's, what's going on here? Uh, and to make a very long story short, there was something wrong with my heart. And um, I found this out the weekend that I'm in the middle of the woods with all these women. There's 25 women, 26 women, something like that. All of us, you know, out in the middle of nowhere. And my cardiologist gives me a call on my sister, uh, one of the ladies that was there's phone, and uh, said, you need to come back as soon as you can. You have something called complete heart block. And I'm assuming that means I can no longer eat, like I have clogged arteries. I have no idea at the time <laughs> what any of that means. So I'm eating s'mores like they're going out of style because I live my life all or nothing, you know? So, uh, and really it has to do with the electricity in my heart. And I have this brand new baby with me and um, you know, there's a nurse there with me that weekend. At the time, I was not a nurse. There's a nurse there with me, and she knows what it means. And uh, it means that my heart's stopping, and it's stopping for anywhere from 8 to 13 seconds, you know. Uh, and so it's depriving my brain of oxygen, which makes me pass out. And, uh, and you know, it's something 70- or 80-year-old men get, not 29-year-old women. And uh, they drove me back the next day. They drove me home. And uh, the nurse came along in case she needed to resuscitate me. You know, I couldn't get people to come and pick me up off of a bridge, you know, in 1992. And here, you know, in 2001, I have people that will gladly ride three or four hours with me in a car to take me home. So if my heart stops, they can restart it. Um, and that's the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, it really is. We show up. We show up for each other here. And that's pretty amazing. So, um, so I get home and, you know, I get put in the hospital, I get put in ICU because my heart's not working, you know, and Alcoholics Anonymous does show up, you know, I do have a fellowship about me and I've got three kids and I'm in ICU and I can't have my kids there. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, my husband at the time wants to be there with me. So you guys show up and you take care of my kids for me. And, um, you know, I recovered from that. You know, I've got a pacemaker, but I've got a second lease on life. And that's great. And that's wonderful. And moving forward, you know, we go on, we're going on in through life. And I have three kids at this point. And I've got uh, Madison, uh, Nicole, and Joshua, uh, who are all amazing today. But uh, so moving forward, we're, we're going through life and we decide we want to go to Florida. And that sounded like a really great idea. I've always wanted to live in Florida. And I have this idea that uh, we're going to go ahead and go to Florida. And I clear it with my sponsor. And 
we get down there and I learned how to meditate in Florida. It was amazing, but I was miserable when I lived there. Uh, what happened was we were very active in Alcoholics Anonymous here. And when we went there, we had to restart our programs all over. And it gave me an opportunity to see how little God I really had in my life. I thought I had this huge, wonderful spiritual life. And what I found uh, was that I didn't and that I really needed to uh, grow my spiritual life. You know, step 11 was thought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him. And at the time, all I knew that that meant was to close my eyes and pray hard. I thought meditation to me was, you know, praying really hard, like, God, please give, you know, whatever it is, you know, give me the strength to, with you, whatever. And uh, I didn't really understand meditation, anything beyond that. And I'm not saying that's wrong. What I'm saying is when I got to Florida, somebody else had a different way of meditation and they taught that to me. And I really could relate to that kind of strengthening my, uh, my prayer and my relationship uh, and through meditation with my higher power. And it meant some quiet time and it meant some time where, you know, I would pray, 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 and then I would listen, you know, and to me, that's what it is today for me. It's listening uh, and not talking. It's about being quiet. And uh, I got to expand on that in my life. Well, life wasn't amazingly wonderful down there because life is up and down, you know, and nobody ever says it's going to be easy. And it wasn't easy. And uh, we moved back about nine months after we moved to Florida and, um, we moved back and um, my marriage fell apart, you know? Um, I wanted my marriage to stay together as much as I possibly could. It was falling apart. And uh, somewhere in there, when we were separated, he came to the house and said, you know, his face was paralyzed. And he said, I'm in a lot of pain. And nobody will help me. And we went to the ER together. Um, and he, uh, you know, he ended up having, uh, cancer inside his head, you know, and it had spread to a lot of places and he was really sick. And, um, so, uh, he came back home and we wanted him back home with his family and, um, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous, we had meetings at the house and people would come to the house cause he wasn't able to get out. You know, that's what we do. We provide service to those who need it, you know, and people provided service, you know, they came to our house and we had big book meetings and, um, you know, it's, it's just what happened. And, uh, after he got well, it, the relationship just, it, you know, we had been in Alcoholics Anonymous as a couple for 14 years. And it's really hard because, you know, I, in my experience was as people pick sides and I don't think it was a, a decision that some people made. I think it just happens. And, uh, you know, I had to keep coming to Alcoholics Anonymous and my mind is my worst enemy. That's where my disease lives. My, my disease lives in my mind. In my mind, you were saying, there's that girl that divorced that guy that had cancer, you know? Uh, and even though he recovered and there was all kinds of stuff going on, I, you know, uh, walk with dignity and grace. My sponsor said, you hold your head high and you walk with dign dignity and grace. And people will know you because of who you are, not what you say. Your actions will speak so loudly that you won't have to use your words. And she was right, you know, and um, I just put one foot in front of the other and went to meetings. And I mean, I had some time where I had a lot of self-pity and, you know, uh, was on my bed uh, dying, <laughs> you know, uh, crying and sad and um, Alcoholics Anonymous. I had a, I was a, I did 12 step work. And um, at this particular time, my, uh, I was doing a um, night owl program. This was years before. And I had picked up the phone uh, one night and spoke to a woman for about two, two hours. And her name is, uh, uh, anyway, spoke to her for about two hours. And she didn't hear anything I said till the very end. And then she said, I asked her if she had any more beer in the house. And she said, yes. And I said, well, drink it and call me tomorrow because that's what we're going to do. I'm not going to sit around and, and not drink any beer that I, I'm going to drink it and then I'll start my new plan. You know, uh, that's the new plan. That's the way that's going to go. And uh, thank goodness she did call. She did call. We did suck her up and, you know, surround her with love and give her Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, uh, gave her the book and walked her through the steps. And, and, you know, we as a family in AA were able to do that. And here we are years later, I think it was like two or three years after that, and I'm going through a divorce and I'm going through a low light in my life. One of the valleys, you know, my getting a wound where God can get in as uh, Timmy said, or as Tim said, and, um, and you show up at my door, you know, and uh, Carol and Karen came to my door and nobody asked me if I wanted to go to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Nobody said, do you feel like maybe you should go to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous? 
uh, Carol said, Karen's going to watch the kids and you're going to get in my car and we're going to your home group. You know, I hadn't been in my home group for a while because I was dying in my house alone because we isolate and die. <laughs> And that's what I was doing. And they came and pulled me out of my house and stuck me in the car. And I was furious. I was just angry. You know, my arms were crossed and I was not happy to be going to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And we went to Fox Hall and we walked into Fox Hall and I was just fuming, you know, and, uh, you know, Noreen came up to me and said, there's a new girl over there. Why don't you go give her your number? And I thought, I don't want to give her my number, you know, and she said, I didn't ask you. And I thought, oh, you know, and rolled my eyes and went over there and said, I'm Kim S and here's my, you know, here's my number, call me. And she never called me and I don't blame her, you know, and I wouldn't want what I had either. If, you know, nine or 11 years of sobriety, I'd have been like, see ya. So anyway, but I felt better. I felt better giving her my phone number. Uh, and it was enough of feel better to bring me back into the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, um, so that's what I did. So I survived that divorce in Alcoholics Anonymous. I survived losing everything I had in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, we lived on a cul-de-sac street. We had to file bankruptcy. We lost everything that we had. I lost friends. I lost AA meetings. You know, I lost a lot. Uh, I lost me, you know, and that's what drove me to drink, you know, is losing me. That became the shell of a person. Now, I didn't, I didn't have to drink over, the, over at this time. You know, I surrounded myself and jumped in the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous, and you loved me until I could get through it, until, until I got through that valley. You did. But the big part of that is I had to be willing to be a part of it. I had to jump into Alcoholics Anonymous and take those jobs and show up at meetings and do the things I didn't want to do. Even when you were saying that they were going to work and I didn't believe you, I had to show up and go anyway. So I showed up and I'm doing Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, and that was nine or 11 years of sobriety. Then I, you know, started doing things on my own and called my sponsor and I, you know, I'm like the committee's going, you know, and, and I found out at about 11 to 13 years of sobriety, I had secrets. I had secrets from my sponsor and, you know, Tim had alluded to it in his talk too. You know, I had this relationship. I didn't feel like it was necessary to tell my sponsor. I wasn't doing anything wrong. He wasn't married. I wasn't married. It wasn't like we were doing anything wrong but I never shared it with my sponsor. <laughs> and I didn't share with her that he was my boss at one time. Those things are probably kind of important. Uh, so here I am, you know, with little tiny things like that, which I call little tiny things like that, coming into my life that I'm not sharing with my sponsor. And I'm, I'm at about 11 to 13 years sober and I'm ready to drink, you know? Uh, and the, the thing about that is, is I was more ready to kill myself than I was to drink. You know, uh, drinking didn't seem like a, an option or a solution for me, but killing myself somehow did. I had a new girl sleeping on my couch, uh, the spiky hair girl. Um, she was not sober at the time, and she was staying on my couch and still not sober. And she looked at me and she said, you think we should do the third step prayer? <laughs> I knew I was in bad shape when, when I knew that she was suggesting that maybe we get on our knees and pray. Um, you know, but I'm always the last to know. It is the story of my life. I am always the last to know where I'm at in my program of recovery. I'm always the last to know what I need and what's good for me. And without you and without searching, you know, through the book and through self, self inventory, I, I don't know where to go or what to do. I read the book. It gives me direction, you know, when in doubt and when in doubt or fear, you know, ask God and he'll remove the fear. Uh, it's just amazing all the answers that are in there. So I get through my divorce and I go through all of that. I change a couple of different jobs. Um, I become self-supporting through a career that I chose doing some photography, uh, which I absolutely loved. Uh, moved my children to a, a different area um, to be closer to some friends in Alcoholics Anonymous. Like my family become, became Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, you became my family. There were so many things I didn't know along the way, like uh, when I called my sponsor and I said, you know, uh, now her job is not to teach me how to do laundry. Let me just get that straight. But, you know, my dilemma was I had, you know, 15 loads of laundry and I was freaked out, you know, and she'd say, you know, Kim, put me down, put me on hold, but get the darks, put the darks with the darks and the whites with the whites, you know, and she walked me through my life like that a lot of my life, you know, I never voted. Uh, for a long, long time, and I'm not bringing up, you know, all the controversy with any of that, trust me, but I didn't know what it meant to vote, and she had me educate myself on that, and now I'm a registered voter, you know, and that's important for me in this day in life, you know, I think that time in school, I drank that day, you know, like, I don't know, I just wasn't present to learn the things that everybody else knew, you all had the secret book of life that I didn't know anything about, and what I didn't know about, you guys taught me, 
You know, you guys taught me how to show up for my kids. You guys taught me how to take them to meetings so that I could get to meetings and that I could be present at an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting because I needed one really bad that day. You taught me how to show up and be of service to others, that other mothers that came in and they needed a meeting and maybe their baby was crying in the background and you could just tell that she needed a meeting and I'm able to go back there and hold that baby and rock that baby and enjoy it because I got to six meetings this week and maybe this was her first one. You know, you showed me how to do that. Um, in my sobriety, my, I had two daughters at the time, and I was not the best parent in the world. And it's not like I was this horrible parent by any means, but I wasn't parenting the way I wanted to be a parent. And I called my sponsor. I had put my daughter down to bed, uh, and I had spanked her. And I had spanked her out of anger and uh, not out of discipline or anything like that. And it didn't make me feel any better, and it didn't make her feel any better. And I actually cried, and she cried, and it was awful. And I went downstairs, and I called my sponsor. And I said, this is what I did. And this is what's going on. And, and, you know, it just feels yucky. It just feels gross. And I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to become the kind of parent my dad was. And uh, she said, okay, well, you know, let's do something about it. Well, the next night it happened again. And I went downstairs and I said, you know, I need like immediate help right away. Like I've got to do something. And she said, well, why don't you take a parenting class? So 20 years ago, I took a parenting class when I first got sober and um, I, uh, you know, I researched it kind of like an Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm all or nothing. And I found this class and this lady that wrote this book uh, was coming to town. And she said, if you pick me up, I'll give you a discount on the program. Um, we'll share a room, we'll share food. And it made it affordable for me to be able to take this parenting course. So I took this parenting course, um, came back, and that was my amends to my kids. Now I had, you know, I worked the steps and I shared my inventory with her, um, you know, and, and making amends. And there were some amends that I couldn't make. Um, and I gave parenting classes away for free for a long time for some amends that I couldn't make, um, some financial amends. I'd made all my financial amends that I could possibly make. I went to the store where, you know, I got a diapers, a cell phone or a cordless phone and some other stuff and they didn't charge me. And I thought, well, that's their fault, not my fault. You know, one of my first amends was going into that store and saying, you know, getting the manager, pulling them into the middle of the clothes saying, I'm Kim and I'm in a program of recovery and this is what happened and this is what we do to stay sober and handing him the 130 something dollars that phone was and him looking at me like I was crazy, like I had 10 heads, you know, and him saying, what, you know, and feeling so great that I got to make that amends and go, you know, and leave the store, you know, and I went out and called my sponsor and I said, I just made this amends and I can't wait to make another one. You know, I can't describe how that feels. I can't give that to you. All I can say is do it, try it, make that amends, you know, make that financial amends, make those personal amends to people. And when you do, the results are just unbelievable. The book talks about how amazing those results are. And I was feeling the benefits of those results, you know, of making those amends and living those lives, you know, teaching those parenting classes, you know, and I'm not perfect, you know, I'm still not perfect. Uh, my children are 26, almost 23, and my son just turned 19. And they live reasonable lives, you know, I mean, I thought my daughter, one of my, my I thought my oldest daughter uh, might be one of us, you know, she uh, um, caught a felony working at Kroger's and she stole from one store and returned it to another store and they caught her and she called to come get me out of this mom and I was like, I, you know, I was able to say I love you, honey, and I'm here for you. Um, you know, but we make amends, you know, and she knew it too and she made amends and did her deal and um, we were at a baseball game for my son because we do that today. We uh, participate as a family and we went to a baseball game and she had a huge, you know, you know, the draft beers you'd get, the huge cups of draft beer you'd get. And she took a sip or two out of it and she was like, oh, that's, you know, that's awful. <laughs> and my mind is saying, oh, just suck, suck it back. Hold your breath. Drink past the ew. You know, you'll get there. <laughs> and she poured it out, you know, and I thought, what's wrong with her? <laughs> Is there something wrong with my daughter? You know, and uh, she's just living Alcoholics Anonymous in her life. She's not, a, she's not a drunk. She's not a drunk. She's normal, you know, and she doesn't want to drink the beer. And I can't stand her pouring it out, you know, and um, she's amazing. She's a paralegal today and she bought a house and, you know, and she's living this life, you know, despite me, you know, and uh, uh, and it's a direct result of, of raising her up in a program of, of recovery uh, the gifts that you have given me, I've been able to take home and give to my family. You know, I would call my sponsor sometimes and she'd say, how would you treat a new girl? And I'd have to go, oh, okay. So I teach my children how to pray. 
you know, I'm teaching it to my new girls. I can teach it to my kids too. Um, and then I have my son, my daughter, Nicole, and uh, she is a firecracker, you know, and she's one of my best friends. And she texted me this morning and she said, uh, let's go kayaking. <laughs> you know, when do you not work so we can go hang out together, you know, and what a gift that is. She's adulting all by herself. She bought a car and insurance on her own without asking me for any advice, permission or anything. Not that she needs my permission, but I want to be wanted, you know. Uh, and then my son, Josh, is in college, you know, he's going to be a nurse, you know. Um, and I, you know, it's, those things that are amazing to me today, despite my best efforts, if I follow the steps of the program, if I put one foot in front of the other and I don't let old ideas hold me back and I don't, you know, let those old ideas hold me from a God of my understanding and I call that sponsor and I participate in my own, my own recovery and I show up and I suit up and I sit up front and I thank people and I just do those things that you know, input into my sobriety, if I participate in my sobriety, and I'm willing to show up and do those things, I get a life beyond my, beyond my wildest dreams, beyond my wildest dreams. I get to go places and do things. It's not about having all the stuff. It's really not. I know it's great. And that's wonderful. And it's nice. But I have friends today that are my family. When people ask me today, you know, are you going to invite your family? I want to invite you guys. You guys are, you know, I go through my list and I think, oh, well, that's my sister. And I'm like, oh, no, that's, no, nope, she's not my sister, really. <laughs> but you are, you're my family. And I think that is such a gift. And I'm very grateful to be asked to speak. And I'm very grateful that you let me have your time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kim, so much. Um, I could identify.